Hello everybody, Pastor Barry here, Griffin Baptist Church. Good to find you today. I wanted to take a moment today, because it is Wednesday, kind of get back to our regular thing and get into the Valley of Vision again. The Puritan Prayer Guide, old prayers, if you remember, hundreds of years old. Um, if you have this book, we're on page 206 today, page 206, because it is a... Um, a new year, especially the first su or first Wednesday in the new year, <clears throat> I wanted to bring you the Puritan's New Year prayer. I want to read it, then I'm going to go back and look at a few things that the Puritan has said in it for our own edification. Remember, this is a prayer, um, so do respect it and treat it like one. Listen to it. Let it be your prayer. Let it into your mind. Uh, let it seep into your heart so it can affect how you live. Puritan says, O Lord, length of days <clears throat> does not profit me, except the days are past in thy presence and thy service to thy glory. Give me a grace that proceeds, follows, guides, sustains, sanctifies, and aids every hour that I may not be one moment apart from thee, but may rely on thy spirit to supply every thought, to speak every word, to direct every step, to prosper every work, to build up every mode of faith, and give me a desire to show forth thy praise, to testify thy love, to advance thy kingdom. <clears throat> I launch my bark on the unknown waters of this year, with thee, O Father, as my harbor, thee, O Son, at my helm, thee, O Spirit, filling my sails. Guide me to heaven by thy loins girt, my lamp burning, my ear open to thy calls, my heart full of love, my soul free. Give me thy grace to sanctify me, thy comforts to cheer, thy wisdoms to teach, thy right hand to guide thy counsel to instruct, thy law to judge, thy presence to stabilize. May thy fear be my all, thy triumphs my joy. Amen. So I just want to look at a few things from this prayer uh, for us to think about even in our own time in 2021. Um, the Puritan starts out his prayer and he says, length of days does not profit me. I think he's absolutely right we live in a culture that thinks that there's some sort of uh virtue or some sort of just inherent goodness to living a long life uh, just because you live a long time does not mean that that amount of time profited you in fact somebody who's not a believer who lives a long life has only heaped up more wrath upon himself uh, a long li life could work against you in the Christian worldview. It doesn't work for you um, outside of Christ. You're just sinning more. You're outside of Christ for longer. You're committing more sins, heaping up more and more and more of the wrath of God. So the Puritan's right when he says the length of days doesn't profit me, except the days are passed in thy presence. Um, any day that we live, in you know, a short life or a long life, in any season, in any condition, if it isn't being passed, whatever day that is, if it isn't being passed in the presence of God, we've simply wasted that day. Whether it be a Tuesday, a Thursday, a Friday, we need to be passing all of our days in God's presence. It needs to start this way, the day needs to continue this way, and then we need to end the day that way and then start it again. Um, you're simply wasting a day if it's not passed in the presence of God. Um, there's people that pass it in the presence of musicians and in the presence of friends and in the presence of entertainment and in the presence of the news and politics and in the presence of many things. Um, none of those things are to replace our day being passed in the presence of God. Um, there's something we get from his presence you can get in no other presence. I don't care what it is. Look what he says next. He says, give me a grace that proceeds, follows, 
guides, sustains, sanctifies, and aids every hour, that I may not be one moment apart from thee. So he's starting his prayer out, and he's saying it doesn't profit him um, for a day, for, in lengths of days, which he's right, like I told you guys, living a long life outside of Christ and just heaping up more wrath, more wrath for yourself, except the days are past in thy presence. Right. And he knows that, and his prayer goes into, because the Puritans are so God-centered, they're not man-centered, they're not just sort of um, thinking that they can just do things on their own strength apart from the grace of God, so he goes into what he, he knows something, he needs to pass his days in the presence of God, and then he asks God for that. He says, give me a grace that proceeds, follows, God sustains, sanctifies, and aids every hour that I may not be one moment apart from thee. He's saying, except the days are past in thy presence, and asking for grace that I may not be one moment apart from thee. We need the work of God in our lives this year in 2021, that his grace would precede us, would follow us, would guide us, would sustain us, would sanctify us, would aid us every single hour of every single day that we might not be Scripture has a lot to say about grace, doesn't it? Paul says probably more about it than anybody else in the New Testament, but the constant theme is, is that the grace of God is enough. The grace of God is sufficient for us. Where sin abounds, even, grace abounds more. The grace of God is vast. The way to God is narrow through Christ, so that that source is very narrow, but the spectrum is very broad. So Christ, the, he's narrow. Unlike, I mean, that, that dude wanted to get up in uh, Washington, D.C. This, this week or last week, whenever it was, and he wanted to pray to Brahmin as a supposed Christian minister. No, sir. The way, the source is narrow. Christ Jesus, the God of Scripture alone, but the source therein, the vastness of the grace and the mercy and the aid of God is limitless and boundless and we'll never be able to plunge the depths of it which is a beautiful thing to remember going into 2021 as we're looking to christ for grace he's not going to run out of it he's not running on less of it it's always there and there's always more for us he says may i may i rely on thy spirit to supply and we need this as a culture oh man do we need this as a culture on um, Rely on the Spirit of God to supply every thought, speak in every word, direct every step, prosper every work, build up every mode of faith, and give me a desire to show forth thy praise, testify thy love, and advance thy kingdom. We live in a culture like he's kind of corrected here at the beginning. We think that just a long life is a virtue unto itself, and it's not. And talking a bunch, and thinking a bunch, and doing a bunch. And going a bunch of places are not virtues unto themselves either. The, we need to be relying on the Spirit of God to direct these things. Every word that we speak, every thought that we think, every step that we take, every bit of work that we do. Um, we're a culture that thinks it's virtuous just to be busy doing things just for the sake of doing things, saying things just for the sake of saying things, and thinking things just for the sake of thinking things. And where that's going to get you is nowhere good. It's going to end up getting you in a mess. Um, your thoughts are going to take over and you're going to fall into despair. Your words will dig you a hole that you're not going to be able to get out of. You could only talk yourself into trouble. Um, and your steps, if they're not led by the Spirit of God, will just lead you uh, in the ways of the enemy. Our work, um, we may just be busy building idols and doing things improperly. The Spirit of God needs to direct all that we do, all that we do. Um, so often, uh, I, just being in so many churches over the last 10 years, I don't know why. I would think that the church would be the one place people would be more cautious with their tongue, but it is among the places that I've seen people are less cautious with their tongue, and they run off at it more often than not. Let 2021 be a year you take these things captive for the lord your thoughts and your tongue and your actions and your steps and let god spirit guide you 
in these things. And if you're wondering, you know, well, how do I know what his spirit's guiding me in these things? You simply read his word, believe his word, go based on the word. We're not just given some sort of spirit of haphazard wonder about what does God want? Um, does God want me to say this? Does God want me to speak that? Does God want me to go here? What does his word say? How does his word say to speak? How does his word say to act? Where does, what does his word say? What kind of company to keep and where to go? This is the only authority for our life. It's not some sort of mystical experience that we're looking for in prayer that, well, you know, I, I just went into prayer and I just really felt that the Lord was telling me to say this. Okay, well, maybe he did, but did you check it with his word? Is, is what you're thinking happened to you in prayer, is it in compliance? Is it in agreement with what is God's already revealed in his word? Um, we're not seeking new revelations in our prayer life. We're seeking the revelations that we think we're getting in our prayer life to be conformed to what God has revealed in Scripture, because Scripture is the sole authority. Everything we do and everything that we say and everything that we believe and everything we want to do or achieve, it's all based on the Word of God. Nothing subjective. He says, build up every moat of faith. Faith is a defense. Uh, they say the best offense is a good defense. The best good defense you can have is the defense of faith. We need a moat, a hedging put around us in 2021 that is faith. And anything that's going to get to us, it's going to have to come through that hedging of faith. And like I said just a minute ago, it's not a faith based on some sort of mystical experience or some faith just based on personal beliefs, preferences, or superstitions. But it's a faith built upon what God's Word has said. Um, if it's built on anything less than that, you're just putting sticks up as a moat, just little flimsy sticks. Um, if you're putting up a moat based on what God has said, you're putting up a firm wall that nothing's going to be able to penetrate to get to you. We need to just encamp ourselves with such a moat of promises of faith based on what God has said to us, about us, and about himself, more importantly. I love the Puritan, he says here, to show forth thy praise, to testify thy love, and advance thy kingdom. To show forth thy praise, testify thy love, and advance thy kingdom. I think if our culture is honest with ourselves, of those three things the Puritan mentioned there, um, we love to show forth thy praise. We love to get together and sing, and we love to get together in church and worship. We have it on the radios, and on the TVs, and we have concerts. We love praise. We love to testify of thy love, too, don't we? We love to tell somebody about how much uh, Jesus loves them, how much Christ has loved us, to sacrifice himself for us. We love to testify of thy love. But this third thing, advance thy kingdom, I think that's the one area, or especially about in the last 100, 150 years, our culture has failed massively. We love to show forth praise. We love to testify thy love. But we do not have any interest, really, in advancing thy kingdom. Uh, even some of the churches that I, I see most busy in evangelism over my time in the American church, they take missions and make them kind of little fun vacation trips that aren't really about missions at all as much as it is just about going somewhere and hanging out and doing something. They turn it into a more of a social activity rather than an advancement of thy kingdom. Um, that was the whole purpose when the Puritans who, whose prayers were reading came to America and set forth even laws and stuff in the 1600s in this country. It was about advancing the kingdom and even advancing the kingdom in a way here that our laws and our land, our government reflected that. Um, where's the passion for this stuff? It, rather than doing that stuff, what we've ended up doing even as a nation, we've rejected that model of God-centered kingdom advancement that was put forth by the Puritans at the beginning, and we've created amendments in the Constitution that says you can't even give somebody a biblical test to make sure that this person that you're going to put in to Congress or to the Senate or to the presidency meets the biblical qualifications of a leader. And so when you, when you create entire amendments in your Constitution where you're saying, nope, you can't give a Christian test to make sure the guy that's in there is fit based on Scripture, uh, why would we be surprised as a nation that we're being bombarded and overran by people in positions of power and government, yeah, who are basically doing the devil's work? We took out the, the, we took out the whole thing that should have been in there based upon Scripture to make sure the people in there were advancing the kingdom of God here. And so now it's, you're always advancing a kingdom. 
The question is, what kingdom are you advancing? Either you're advancing the kingdom of hell or the kingdom of heaven. Uh, there's no in-between at all. Um, sadly, when, you're, when you make moves to restrict the kingdom of God, um, to restrict Christians as, as far as um, promoting Christianity in lofty places, you're just going to help the enemy out there. But where is the passion for this? We are raising up children, even on our own day. They can defend our politics better than they can defend our faith. They tend to be more passionate about their politics than their faith. They, they seek lofty things as far as um, conservatism goes, but not as far as Christianity goes. We need to be raising up young men and women who are brave and who say, you know, there's, there's a hill out there on a land out there that doesn't even have the Bible in their own language. They don't know the Lord. I want to go there. I want to advance the kingdom there, and I want to plant the flag of Christ on a bit of land that no one's ever planted it on before. This is the heart of the Christian. This is, this is the heart of the Christian. The heart of the Christian is not pushing conservative Americanism across the globe. The heart of the Christian is pushing Christianity across the globe. We have seem to even have taken good things like Americanism and conservatism and put it above our faith at times to where we're more concerned with advancing that than advancing the kingdom. You can give Afghanistan democracy. I've been there. You can give them your constitution. Um, all they're going to end up doing is is making some sort of crazy Sharia law because democracy is going to vote it in. And as far as God goes, they're just going to adhere to the Quran and Allah. The thing that cha transforms nations is not constitutional republics. The things that transform nations is the word of God. That'll change areas and regions of the world and people groups and cultures in a way that, that your fickle um, temporal national stuff just won't be able to even hold a flame to. The power of God is his word, not anything strictly American in politics. Those things should reflect his word. His word is paramount. His word is foundational. His word is the source. Everything else is supposed to be an outflowing of that. We've got the cart before the horse at times here, and I, no wonder this whole thing is getting wrecked in the West, it seems. Look at what the Puritan says here. Guide me to heaven by thy loins girt, my lamp burning, my ear open to thy calls, my heart full of love, and my soul free. I mean, you can hear the imagery of Scripture in that, can't you? Like, my lamp burning, so you, the parable of the virgins with the lamps and the oil, and some didn't have oil and others did, and their lamps went out. So we want our lamps to have oil in it, to be burning. Beloved, let me tell you something. I, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but, and I'm not even sure on a lot of things as it comes to eschatology and the end times. You know, I, I understand all the different views, and I'm comfortable with understanding that, but I'm sort of a pan-millennialist, and I think that when God returns, I'll understand it perfectly. Until then, I, I know some truths about it, but I don't really know anything for as certain as I know the gospel or the nature of God or any of those other things that are really clear in Scripture. I do know Christ is returning. Um, I don't claim to know a date or anything like that, but let me tell you something. We need to keep our ears open to thy call, like the Puritan says here. Um, you don't have to be a prophet or a son of a prophet to turn on your news, to look at current events, to just see stuff um, happening all around the world in all the different ways that it happens, whether it's um, just the nation, the world turmoil, um, plagues like we're going through right now, uh, wars and rumors of wars. You get all this stuff going, but then you also have the advancement of the gospel in a way that we've never seen in human history over covering the world like the waters cover the earth, like Scripture says. I mean, it is out there. And you see all these things converging in such a way that you would be a fool not to make sure your ears are open to the call of the Lord. Uh, maybe 2021 will be that call. But if it is that call, how, how's the Lord going to find you when he returns? What if he returned today? What if he returned before this video was over, before the sun goes down on this beautiful day? What is he going to find you doing? Is he going to find you in open rebellion to the authorities that God's placed over you, whether they be in your church or otherwise? Is he going to find you being hostile and gossiping and being busy about doing evil stuff and being selfish and promoting politics more than the gospel, creating divisions and sowing discord? How is he going to find you if that call were to come even today? 
This is how the Christian lives. We live with our eye set on eternity, with every day being the hope of thy call, but being prepared every day to meet the Lord if it's that day. Um, there's so many people that it's like they don't, they don't even think it's going to happen. And I, even myself being as unsure as I am about how all this works out, I look at world events, current events in the scriptures, and I go, my goodness, my goodness, it, it's, it, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Even the love of many just waxing cold and people turning against each other. Even our nation right now may be on the verge at the beginning point. What historians will look back on in the future and say, yeah, this was the beginnings of the Civil War when all this stuff started happening and this was leading to the Civil War. Um, we've never been a country as divided as we are right now since the Civil War. And you see it everywhere. I see it everywhere all the time in the grocery stores, in churches, in politics, on the TV, on the internet. It's everywhere. This country is just so divided and everyone's so quick to draw lines and create enemies. And not, they're not quick to want to reconcile or, or want to let bygones be bygones or secondary issues be secondary issues. They're trying to die on every old hill. And I just don't, we got to be Christians. Like the Puritan says, my heart full of love. Where's a heart full of love and a soul that is free? Um, we, sh we should be different as Christians during a time of such division nationalistically and globally right now. We should be the people that are about reconciling, the, the people who are about getting, getting along and getting together and sharing love and Christ with each other. We shouldn't be people rabble-rousing, tearing churches and families and nations apart. Because let me tell you, beloved, if you've never seen war, you don't want to see it. And the last thing you want to see is it over here. You don't want to see it. It's going to be a lot easier to keep it from happening than it will be to stop it once it happens. You don't want to see that horror here. I mean, it, when you're in war, I mean, it's like today. It's a beautiful day, blue skies, birds chirping, butterflies flying around. And it's like the most nasty, violent, foul thing is happening around you with a blue sky over your head. Um, you don't want that here. We need to be people who are trying to reconcile, who are trying to spread grace and mercy and peace and love. And yet, if we get pushed to a point where there's no other option, we get pushed to a point where there's no other option. But we're not trying to jump at that option and just run off at our mouths and be sowing division and discord and hate. That's not the Christian's way. That's a zealot's way. And Christ stood against that sort of zealot nature, even in the first century in his own time. The Puritan says, Give me thy grace to sanctify me, thy comforts to cheer, thy wisdom to teach, thy right hand to guide, thy counsel to instruct, thy law to judge, thy presence to stabilize. May thy fear be my all, and thy triumphs my joy. Christ is all in all. His grace is everything. He is everything. Comfort, wisdoms, right hand to guide. In other words, power and authority is seen as right-handed imagery. Thy counsel to instruct. Law to judge, presence to stabilize. You know, we're Christians. We're not under the law of God in that sort of old covenant way. But there's no better law as far as the principles of God go. Thy law to judge. How do we know what's the right thing to do? How do we know what principles to adopt in hardships and in difficulties? You look to the law of God for that. And while we're not under the law of God, uh, if you kill somebody, we're still going to convict you as being a murderer. The law of God is integral into having a society that is cohesive, to having a church that is cohesive, to having a family that is cohesive and a culture that is cohesive. You throw away the, the law of God and all of that wisdom that we're supposed to be meditating upon day and night and praising God over, you're going to be left with chaos and a vacuum that will be filled by something. And it'll be a law, but it won't be the law of God. It'll be law of the enemy. Look here at the end. He says, May thy fear be my all, thy triumphs my joy. He ends this prayer about the new year, looking at the new year, looking at awe and joy. But what is the awe? Thy fear, the fear of the Lord. Uh, in other words, this sort of holy res reverence that we have when we come before God because of who he is and how mighty he is, the, the way that we tremble by, in front of his holiness and his might and his power. Um, he's our friend, sure. 
He's our Father, sure. But He's also God. We hold attention with these things. We come before Him confidently like He is the Father to us that He claims He is, and we come before Him fearfully and respectfully and humbly and lowly like He's the God that He claims that He is. Um, this is our awe. This is the awe of the Christian every day when we just think upon God as He's revealed Himself to us in all of His power and His glory and His majesty. And when we come before that, and we fear in that awe, well, there's nothing in the world that's going to capture our, our, our awe. There's no power here. There's no beauty here. There, there's just nothing here that's going to do it for us um, once we've had that. Nothing can t capture that awe away from God. And he said, thy triumphs my joy. Thy triumphs my joy. Where are you going to find joy in this new year? I'm with the Puritan. Let it be in thy triumphs. You want to see thy triumphs? Share the gospel. Share the love of Christ. Be about reconciliation, not about division. Be about evangelism and missions and winning people over to Christ. These are the triumphs of the gospel. These are the triumphs that we do find joy in. These are things that even confound modern wisdom and modern science. It, it, it's a supernatural stuff. Everything else is natural. These sorts of things are supernatural. This is the joy of the Christian walk. This is where it needs to be this year. This is exactly where we need to find it. In the triumphs of Christ that, praise God, he lets us be part of. Um, I remember being in college. How could I forget? It took eight years. And I remember I had this one professor that gave this imagery when talking about the triumphs of God going forth into the world and conquering nations and families and hearts and souls. And he said, it, he said it's as though God is a body as the church in the world, but he's given us as its hands. So God's reaching out in the world, but the hands through which he's reaching out into the world is us, as Christians, is the church. We're the hands and the feet of God in the world. We go forth, we grab hold, we do this work. God gets all the glory. It is him doing it because he's the one animating the limbs, driving the feet forward, um, sending the nerve signals to the hands in the world to do the work that it does. But Make no mistake, we're the hands and the feet of God in the world. I thought that was such a beautiful, powerful imagery that we oftentimes forget of the importance of the role that God's called us into with him in this triumph, in this joy, in this mission. That's the whole point of today. What's the point of today? What's the point of any day? The glory of God. There may be uh, political rallies in D.C., and there may be uh, other things happening in the world, and... Navy carriers getting close to foreign countries who have their military on high stand and all this sort of stuff. There may be births and deaths and all this stuff going on. The whole point of the day is the glory of God and the salvation of souls. God reconciling what was lost to himself. That's the point of it today. If you get involved in anything else today and fail to be involved in that and whatever you do, you have failed at the day. Get in the presence of God. Stay in the presence of God by His grace all the year long. In everything you say, do, think, and everywhere you go, let it be all about the glory of God. You're not His judge. You're not His ex executioner. You're His child, and you've been called as His hands and feet in the world, doing His work with reconciliation to lost souls before the day of the Lord, which could come even today in which he will right all wrongs, in which he will punish all evil, and no one will be able to hide from him. The great and terrible day of the Lord, according to Jeremiah. That's not today, praise God. That today is a day of reconciliation, of love going forth, and of relationships being forged. None any less than you and God. Walk in his presence, beloved. I love you guys. If you need me, you give me a holler. I'm about to leave here in a minute. i got some ministry I need to go do for a dear soul and member of our church. Um, but keep me in your prayers. My hand still hasn't completely healed yet. It's still an open wound at the top. I can't get the two sides of the skin to close. So it's kind of annoying me, and I can feel disheartened by it sometimes. But um, not being able to use my right hand, um, like Paul, I just want to give God thanks for everything. And I see how he's kind of slowed me down with this in a way that I'm paying more attention to him 
I'm getting help from others as I need it, which is humbling. Um, but he's really teaching me a lot, as he's teaching all of us something with whatever our troubles is, and we should be able to give him all the praise and all the glory for it. There's not a thing going on that we can't thank God for. I love you guys. God bless you.